Thank you, Barbie, and welcome everyone to this uh, launch of this really exciting center. It's been such a pleasure over the last year to first talk with Barbie, to learn about her plans, to see them come into fruition um, has been really, really a treat. Um, a few weeks ago, I got to talk to one of Barbie's students, Mira McCann, who's sitting here, and she has this terrific podcast. And this morning, I got to listen to episode three of Mira's podcast, in which five Annenberg faculty consider what is media at risk to them. As you heard, I'm not Annenberg faculty. I'm faculty in the School of Arts and Sciences. And I think about media at risk in a slightly different way. At the Program in Environmental Humanities, we're thinking about ecological media, not in the way perhaps exactly that media professionals think about that, but in the deep and profound ways that we as humans are rewriting the media of our very planet, that is the air, water, and clouds um, in which we live. So it's a real pleasure to have work with the Center for Media at Risk as we are on a planet at risk. I'm going to give a brief word about housekeeping uh, before I introduce our super exciting speakers this morning. Mira is going to help me in that housekeeping task. We really are excited for a very robust Q&A session and thus are asking our speakers um, to keep it to 10 minutes and to help them do that and to help us stay on time. We have a handy dandy one minute <laughs> uh, for when you get to, to nine minutes. Um, and afterwards, uh, we will be calling on you from the floor, just as we see you. As you heard, there are microphones in the ceiling, so <laughs> we won't need to circulate the, the microphone, um, but it is being recorded, so please do speak up. Um, our first speaker this morning is Maria Ressa. Um, Maria is the CEO. These are very brief introductions. We'll get right to it. She is the CEO and Executive Director of Rappler and joins us from the Philippines to address how to combat exponential lies. Our second speaker will be Samuel Sinyangwe, who is the co-founder of Campaign Zero, a policy analyst and a data scientist, and he will speak to us on digital activism, risks, and rewards. The third speaker is Amy Siskind, author of The List, a week-by-week -week reckoning of Trump's first year. She will be discussing writing history in the age of social media and how she has been able to keep up with it. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and our final speaker uh, is uh, Zainab Tufekci, author of Twitter and Tear Gas, The Power and Fragility of Networked, Pro of networked Protest. Uh, she will be talking on addressing fake news and the role of journalism. We'll start with Maria. It will drown me. This is what happens when you're really short. Uh, uh, I have 10 minutes. So why don't you guys, did you see that uh, there's this play that starts at the end and goes backwards in time? Uh, Stephen Sondheim play. You know, they graduate high school and you, you start with where they already are today and then, and then you go back in time to that idealistic time. So that's my foreshadowing. Uh, here's where I am today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, two days ago, three days ago, I got my fourth subpoena. Um, I've been a journalist my entire life. It's been almost 32, 33 years that I've been a journalist. A lot of it as a television journalist. I ran the uh, Manila Bureau for CNN and then the Jakarta Bureau for another decade. And then I ran the largest news group in the Philippines. I would never have thought that I would have to consider being arrested or even having to carry bail money because you don't actually know when you're gonna get arrested, right? Um, the, the subpoena I received this week was for, ah, uh, my gosh, which one? This one is a tax evasion case. The company I started, oh, here's moving backwards, uh, six years ago, I left traditional media, traditional television, and I decided to jump in and cr help create a new company. And this company uh, is called Rappler. It's based in the Philippines. We have a bureau in Jakarta. 
Three days ago, I got a subpoena for tax evasion in the hundreds of millions of pesos because uh, when I raised, when we raised money, they essentially classified, the Philippine government classified our company as a securities company rather than a holding company for a journalism, for a news group. So that means that now I face criminal charges for taxes. This is the second criminal charge I face. The first one was a charge by President Duterte himself that um, we are owned and controlled by foreigners and we are out to take down the government, none of which is true. That's where t this year brought me, January this year. So I have, we have six cases against us. Um, what are we doing? Uh, journalism. The same thing that I learned when I was 20, and we keep evolving the discipline, the standards and ethics of journalism, even as we shifted online. So let me tell you a little bit about what brought us there and how the platform, the technology, that really gave so much promise uh, of, of being able to leapfrog development, of being able to build institutions bottom up, um, how that same platform, an American company, is now being used to circumvent democracy. The Philippines is one of 30 countries that freedomhouse.org says has cheap armies on social media that are stifling dissent and shaping reality. You call it alternative reality. Um, I think I just call it lies. Uh, what happened, uh, so let me go back to Rappler. The idea behind Rappler was to take our discipline, the standards and ethics, connect that, here's my Venn diagram, connect it with technology, and then the last part is use that to build community. So in 2012, um, 12 of us, I came from, from managing a news group of 1,000 people after I left CNN, and then we left that and started with 12. Four or five of us above 40, and then the rest, we hired the smartest 20-somethings you could find. What I learned is that if you're in your 40s, whatever thing you think about will cost way more money than what your 20-somethings will think about, because they'll think about it for free. So Rappler, using social media, using technology, grew 100%, 100 to 300% year on year for the first three to four years. We ran into the first roadblock in 2016. I think 2016 is that inflection point for for the world. Um, and I point to 2015 as the time when um, Facebook took instant articles, enticed all the news groups to come on board. When we came on board using the same algorithms, all of a sudden, news, facts, you know, news is never really popular, right? When I ran the largest news group in the Philippines, uh, we were in a television station where only, we had 20% of the programming, but only 1% of the population watched the news, right? So we're public service. We always have been. The majority will not come into news. Um, Facebook is our public space. In the Philippines, the internet is Facebook because 97% uh, of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. So Facebook was the platform when Rappler began, up to 75% of our, of our incoming traffic was coming from this platform. So we couldn't have grown without it, but with Facebook and Twitter, with this new technology, all of a sudden, uh, we were able to, within a year and a half, become the third top online news site in the Philippines. What's our goal? I've worked for, gosh, for CNN, I worked for 20 years in countries where uh, law and order is weak, corruption is rampant, and you are just impatient because there are no institutions. We have extremely weak institutions. So what we were after was helping build institutions bottom up. And from 2012 to 2016, we precisely did that. We had our investigative journalists, and then we had our a civic engagement arm, we had a tech arm, we had video, we put television in your pocket. Okay, why did it all go wrong? And what happened? And what role did Rappler play? I, you, I would come back to the States in 2015 and 2016. I'd come back and say the Philippines 
is a cautionary tale for the US because we, our presidential elections were six months ahead of yours. And after our president was elected, Rudy Duterte, he was a mayor, mayor of Davao City from 1988. So unlike your president, he has a lot of experience in governance, right? Kind of what kind of experience you have to ask about, you can see what happened. Um, he won in May and then July, uh, he began a drug war. He was the first president elected by a social media campaign machinery. And it wasn't af until after he was elected, in July of 2016, that it became weaponized. So this was something that didn't feel homegrown, right? So they used social media to win very nicely organized messaging and distribution networks, uh, used social network cascade theories, very nice. But after he won, on, in July of 2016, he decided to boycott traditional media. He would only talk to state media and pro-Duterte bloggers who were part of this machine. And then the social media campaign machinery pivoted and, and became weaponized. What did they do? They attacked anyone who questioned the drug war. In July, we were getting, uh, our, our reporters would go out at night and you know, they'd see an average of eight dead bodies on the sidewalk every night. Um, the estimate of human rights groups from July to January 31 was that there were 7,000 people killed in the drug war, something that the government then splintered by changing definitions. So now you have no idea exactly how many people have been killed in the drug war. It goes anywhere from 4,000 to 20,000, depending on who you talk to, but there are thousands. And that's more people than were killed during martial law in, in the 70s to 80s, right? Um, it all began on social media. That weaponization that, that happened targeted anyone who questioned the drug war. Then after that, the targeting is not normal. Targeting is very personal attacks. Cursing, cursing is like minor, but these are attacks on uh, extremely sexist, misogynistic comments. Oh, I have one minute left. Let me, let me summarize it in one word. What happened was propaganda, which has always been there, became exponential. A lie told a million times is a truth. You just, you just don't have a time to catch up. And when Rappler exposed this, uh, this machinery, because we started gathering the data, um, now we have a database of roughly 350 million public comments from about 12 million accounts, which tracks what we call the shark tank. That is the propaganda machine. That's anyone also who spreads this stuff, right? Um, what that does is when it's targeted, and there's several examples, you silence dissent. You silence questions. You silence criticism. Uh, we were part of a study that looked at what we called patriotic trolling. Have you guys heard that phrase? Online state-sponsored hate that aims to intimidate and silence criticism, questions, dissent. And when you do that, playing with the algorithms of our social media platforms, so the algorithms already segment and echo, right? So if you're pro, you're here, and you're only talking to yourselves, so you're pushed even further. You're anti, you're here, you're pushed even further. You have no public space. Then you add hate at the fracture lines of society, and you have silence, and you have a malleable society. Um, my time is up. There's a lot more. What I'll do is I'll tweet. I'm at, at Maria Ressa. I'll tweet more of this stuff and then look forward to the questions and chatting with you. Thanks. Cool. So my name is Sam Sinyangwe, co-founder of Campaign Zero. Uh, so I'm going to tell a story about uh, my work. My work focuses on ending police violence in the United States, and I've been doing this uh, since August 9th. 2014. So on August 9, 2014, Mike Brown Jr. was shot and killed in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri. Um, his death sparked a wave of protests that is sustained to this day and sparked the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, in the early days and weeks and months of that movement, one of the central questions uh, that kept coming up again and again and again in the media uh, was a question around data. Because what we saw was com were communities coming forward and saying that there was a deep systemic issue uh, with policing and police violence, particularly against black Americans. And what we heard from police and conservatives was, and policymakers was sort of dismissing this and saying, we don't have the data, so we don't know whether that's true. 
Uh, and the reason that that happened was because the federal government to this day does not collect comprehensive data on people killed by police. And so simply the data wasn't there to answer those questions. Uh, and then what, that ha what happened was there was this huge delay then in any sort of conversation about solutions. So at that time, uh, I connected with activists on the ground uh, in Ferguson uh, through Twitter. So first thing is Twitter as an infrastructure for the movement. Uh, a digital infrastructure for the movement has been really essential. Connected through Twitter, didn't know any of them, hadn't met them, uh, and, and asked a question about whether they wanted a partner to build a database to answer these questions. Um, together, we were able to build the most comprehensive database of people killed by police in the United States at mapping police violence. We were able to do uh, breakdowns by race, by place. We looked at the 100 largest cities in America. Uh, and we could actually answer some of these questions. We were able to, sh to show that you know, black people were three times more likely to be killed by police more likely to be unarmed. Uh, we were able to show which cities had high rates of police violence, which had lower rates. Um, and then we were able to use digital tools in a way to effectively crowdsource solutions. So having the data on one hand, oh, I think it works. Um, yes, partners. <laughs> the map, OK, so we launched with this map. Um, this was at Map and Police Violence. It's actually animated. If you go to mapandpoliceviolence.org, uh, there's a timeline. And as the, this is the year, um, there are about 1,200 people killed by police every year in this country. Uh, and what you see on the map is a timeline of those deaths over the course of the year. Um, and the design of the map is meant to do one thing very simply, and that is convince you that there is a national crisis. Um, because at this time that we launched, this was right before the Baltimore uprising in early 2015. Um, the country wasn't yet convinced there was a national crisis. People were convinced there was something going on in Baltimore and St. Louis, uh, but a lot of people didn't know that this was much closer to home. And so what we used through, through this visualization is uh, really to show the scale of this crisis uh, and how close it really is. So demands. We were able to work with activists across the country, dozens of activist groups in, in many, many states uh, to crowdsource the demands from protesters. Uh, we put this on the map at the demands.org. And together with these demands and the data that we're able to collect uh, and the research literature, we created, we synthesized all of that information into a 10 point policy plan uh, called Campaign Zero. So, this is the first policy platform released within the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and, you know, we released this to be very clear and to show that there's a con this requires a comprehensive approach to deal with a complex situation. Um, the next thing that we did was visualize this information for, every, for the 100 largest cities in the country. So we took that policy agenda, matched it up against what, the extent to which various police departments actually had these policies in place. The goal here very simply is for anybody in these cities to be able to see, you know, my city has, it requires the escalation. It doesn't actually require officers to intervene if they witness another officer using excessive force. It doesn't require officers to give a warning before shooting somebody. Uh, and you can actually, this is interactive, you can click on it and see the specific policy language uh, that defines this so that they know specifically going into meetings what to change. So another piece. Uh, so again, yeah, I'm, I'm talking here about some possibilities about digital activism. Uh, what we're able to do, number one, build the most comprehensive database of people killed by police. Number two, identify effective solutions and crowdsource solutions from people across the country. Uh, and number three, what we're able to do is build tools that make it easier for people to advocate for changes at the local, state, and federal levels. So we built this tool that allows you to put in your zip code. It shows your local, state, and federal representatives what votes they've taken on police reform measures, and then allows you to contact them in three clicks or less. So we had over 100,000 people across the country use this tool to contact their representatives because we've been able to synthesize all of that complexity into a very simple tool. These things have made a difference. So we influenced the Obama 21st Century Task Force on Policing Report. We shaped and informed Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders uh, racial justice platforms during the campaign and met with them. Changed local police department policies in a number of cities from Baton Rouge uh, to Orlando, Florida uh, to Sacramento. And able to, to crowdsource and engage people at scale in the work of creating change. And I think that's one of the biggest possibilities here is that we were able to launch this, this simple survey platform that asked people you know, what type of work they wanted to do, whether it was research policy solutions, track legislation, um, you know, collect data and statistics. We were able to sign up 33,000 people in the space of a few weeks through Twitter alone. Uh, and each person filled out this long survey, it was like 15-minute survey. In hindsight, it probably should have been like two minutes. Um, but 
through that, we're able to get this wealth of, uh, of people that wanted to get engaged in this work. And that's been the engine that has sustained that work. So when you see the research that we did on the 100 largest police departments, those are people that we recruited online, each of whom researched the, the policies of their own city. Um, you know, the tool where we built that for people to contact their representatives, same thing, developers and designers that we were able to enroll as volunteers online. So altogether, what that means is through digital tools, we were able to do what many large and well-resourced organizations have struggled to do quickly, and that is move quickly build platforms and tools that are able to engage people at scale and harness the potential of this movement. Uh, but it is just the beginning. If you look at survey research, there's 104 million Americans who support the Black Lives Matter movement. 104 million. I'll remind you, there's like 60 million people who voted for Trump. Um, but at best, it's a tiny fraction of that number of people engaged in the work of creating change on a daily basis. And so the question is, how do we close that gap? Uh, and this is not unique to Black Lives Matter. This, you take any issue, uh, whether it is economic justice or reproductive justice or climate change, you always have at least 100 million Americans who support it, probably more Americans who support it than oppose it. Uh, the problem is with social movements, how do we actually harness and leverage the potential uh, at scale of that many people? Uh, and so the tools that we've launched are, are a small uh, and beginner. Um, a, a beginning foray into that, and we're trying to advance further. So I'm going to close with a little bit about the risks. Um, so promises and potential, there's a lot, huge upside. Risks, there are really serious risks. So this is a tweet that went out, um, it said June 14th, 2016. This is right before the Republican National Convention. This is a fake news tweet, so didn't actually say this. Um, so here is what they, they tweeted these, these screen, quote unquote screenshots of direct messages on Twitter between me uh, and my colleagues. What they have me saying here essentially is that I have an army of 10,000 people ready to descend upon the Republican National Convention, cause chaos, prevent Donald Trump from being elected president, and force Obama to invoke martial law so he can have a third term in the presidency. And the people believed it. So. That went out, started circulating in sort of the alt-right uh, ecosystem. Infowars, all of these sites started uh, having articles about it. Black Lives Matter activists want to shut down Republican National Convention. And their whole echo chamber thought this was real. And so you would see in the run-up to the Republican National Convention, there were actually ads on Craigslist uh, seeking to recruit uh, ex-military and ex-law enforcement to protect the convention, citing these tweets as the threat. Um, I got threats, personal threats, uh, to my, my home because of this. And uh, a few weeks after this happened, the FBI showed up at my doorstep. And wanting to know about my plans for the upcoming national convention. So this stuff is very real, right? Um, and it is one of the risks of engaging in digital activism is that fake news can spread very quickly. There are a lot of people who will believe it, and a lot of those people are armed. Uh, and some of the nation's premier law enforcement actually is not very good at telling the difference either. So that's sort of closing, and I look forward to the questions later. Hi, everyone. So I, I think I'm a little different than everybody else in the audience because I haven't uh, had any experience in journalism um, after freshman year English, which was mandatory at Cornell. Uh, I, I am, by background, a um, economics major with a minor in math and computer science who um, got involved politically. And when Trump took office, became alarmed at some of the things that were happening in our country that were not normal. And I read up on authoritarian regimes um, through journalists who were knowledgeable on that. One is here today, Ruth ben -Giat. Um And I, I took their advice, which was to start to write things down. Um, in November of 2016 is when I started. And the thing that spurred me to do it is early on as Trump was taking office, the, the amount of lies that were being told, and as Sarah Kenzior kind of talks about in the preface to my book, that the act of lying is almost an act of them letting us know they can get away with it. Um, 
And the early weeks of when I started to keep track, there were a lot of unusual things happening that Trump did not have a traditional um, vision or policies, that the hatred of others was being stoked um, and still continues today to be flamed as a way to keep him in power. So the act of writing things down, which in my first week was nine items that were not normal, um, and as I sat there that night making the list, I thought, wow, there's this great tweet from a New York Times reporter, which is still up on my website, theweeklylist.org, from the first week, critical of his own paper's coverage. And then that next morning when I went to go look for the tweet, it had disappeared. He had taken it down, which was also telling. But in the early weeks, the list was nine items of not normal things, which again are not in the construct of Republican versus Democrat, but things that are a risk to our democracy or what have traditionally been American values or strange things in the media. Um, the list currently has grown to over, last week was 163 items. As, as Trump has staffed up his regime uh, and there's more people in, 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 sort of have their hands at the task of deconstructing our fragile democracy, um, the amount of not normal things happening are flying at increasing rates and we've come to live in chaos. And hence over time, I have now understood the importance that I started to write things down, even though I didn't know anything about journalism, because we are living in chaos and we are forgetting what's happening. And I have a, a constant like pushback about, well, how is the media doing? And I guess that's a question for all of us today. How is our media doing in covering an authoritarian regime? Well, you know, I, I, I am very protective of the media in a way, and I personally try to get as many subscriptions as I can to both, both national and local media because I realize the import of their investigative journalism. But in a lot of ways, by design, the way our media is set up to cover events, they're also failing the American people. Um, and I look at a week, I'm gonna talk about an example, which was two weeks ago, um, when the list was 156 not normal items. And quick trip down memory lane, that was the week Scott Pruitt was in the news, like every day. And our media was tripping over themselves to find like the next little tidbit about like, did he spend this much on a first class flight? Did he spend this much on his phone booth? Which is all interesting and they were like sort of super fascinated with it. I mean, a bigger story might have been that he doesn't believe in climate change, that he's taking down information from the website and starting in the early weeks of my list um, after meeting with Dow Chemical CEO um, took away a restriction on using a pesticide which pediatricians have already found is harmful to children. And by the way, they donated to Trump's inaugural campaign. Um, that to me is more interesting. But going back to week 73, what our media didn't cover was all the other stories of what's happening to the marginalized communities in our country week after week. Um, the rise of Trump's ICE, which is very similar to the uprising of Hitler's Gestapo. There was no coverage of things that were happening to our environment, to restrictions being taken away. Um, and so what, what I try to do each week, because I know the media reads my list, is to put together things that they need to know and focus on. Because it, it's become the 80-20 rule, where 80% of their focus is on 20% of what happens in a week. And the other stories are getting single source coverage in their local markets or no discussion. For example, that particular week, the number one item on my list was the fact that Trump's Department of Homeland Security had started to keep a database of journalists. Remember that story? It happened on a Friday afternoon it came out, and those of us on social media were so alarmed and tweeting it out, and it got no media coverage, major media coverage. I mean, you didn't see it on MSNBC, you didn't see it on CNN. All they wanted to talk about was Pruitt and who could find the next scoop about what Pruitt had done. So that's been typical of, of a pattern that I find. Um, another week that that happened was the week of the Nunes memo, whether that was gonna come out or not, and if every day it was like a different iteration, is Trump gonna release it, is he not gonna release it? And that week there were 150 items, and again, like 20 of them related to Nunes. So what I've tried to do with the exercise of keeping the weekly list is highlight things that are not normal and are changing in our democracy and changing in our values. And so very purposely at the top of the list each week, I put things that are happening to marginalized communities. Like this week up in Syracuse, there was a raid at a farm by ICE. They took away a worker while the, the, the farmer's children were being taken away in a bus, even though they had no warrant. 
Um, ICE has been terrorizing Americans and, and undocumented uh, immigrants around our country quietly for weeks, and that's a major theme of my list. That again gets very little national coverage. Other themes um, that, I, that I've noticed that are, are getting very little coverage or get sporadic coverage is what's happening to our media. So like two weeks ago, voila, finally we're talking Sinclair Broadcasting, which is all over my weekly list, not only Sinclair, but the changing landscape of our media. Um, if those of you not familiar, Sinclair now enters 72% uh, of local media homes, which for many is their only access to media. Um, and in order to do that, one of the first acts of um, Trump's FCC chair was to get rid of a regulation from the 1970s um, that allowed that increase to happen for Sinclair, who, by the way, happens to be a supporter of Trump. Uh, or the supporters of Trump who have bought local media in New York, the Gothamists or DNA Info in New York, uh, the LA Weekly in LA, the second largest newspaper, and shut them down. The Koch brothers now own Time, Inc. Um, Trump has very purposely threatened CNN since the early weeks of my list, that he, that he and his son and his son-in-law have threatened executives at Time Warner and AT&T that they would not let their merger happen unless CNN gave him better coverage, and look what's happened. So those are examples to me that are beyond what we know of, of his daily diatribes on Twitter against the Washington Post or uh, the New York Times of, of the ways that our landscape is actually changing. And then there's the actual exercise of writing things down. And I remember reading the articles about authoritarian early on, and I think it was Marsha Gessen who said, you know, that these things would happen slowly, but don't get fooled by like good acts because there would be many more bad acts. And it was Sarah who said to write things down because in an authoritarian regime, information would be less accessible. And one thing that I capture in the list is how information has disappeared from websites. Two weeks ago, information on breast cancer, um, science, climate change, uh, information that is of help to people in marginalized communities like the LGBT community, people of color and finding housing, on and on. But then we also have the repeal of net neutrality, which um, I was not planning to put the list into a book. I had no sort of vision of how this would all play out. But to me, that was then the, the linchpin for me deciding to put it in writing, because information is literally disappearing around us. And as fantastical as some of these things sound, that information could disappear and the idea that you would have books and the books could be burned, like that happens in authoritarian regimes, this is literally happening. This is the stuff I was warned about in November 2016 that is not so slowly playing out in our democracy. So I, I just want to close out on, on just the notion of re-examining our media. Um, Jay is here who, was, who um, is a great critic of the media. I think it's a responsibility for those of us who can be watchdogs on the media to call them out. There's a certain chummy nature within Twitter and social media of them kind of you know, giving each other's voices and amplifying the same message, da, 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 and sort of swinging around the same stuff again and again. And not enough view from 10,000 feet down um, on stories like Sinclair Broadcasting, they'll forget that in two weeks. They'll forget about Cambridge Analytica and the fact that there are items in every, weekly, every week of my weekly list that indicate our, our uh, election may have not been a fair election. And, and so these broader themes and the fact that Trump is cozying up with an authoritarian leaders and not with our NATO allies, those have been lost. And the stories of what is happening to change the fabric of our country, the things that ICE is doing, the, the um, rollback of, of some rules from half a century ago, like Sessions trying to get rid of parts of the Civil Rights Act relating to sexual orientation, those are the untold stories that are actually more meaningful than whether Scott Pruitt had a phone booth in his, in his office. So I'm going to leave you with that. All right. I am another one of those people who's going to disappear behind the panel. <laughs> OK. so. Um, I want to talk, uh, I want to start my talk by giving an example I've written about, but I think it's sort of the striking example that deserves to be uh, heard again. And it'll go back to the Ferguson protest that uh, was talked about in the first conversation. So in August of 2014, uh, when um, the, after 
Michael Brown, the African-American teenager who had been killed by the police officer. Um, after that event, there was a lot of unrest in the community. We've seen since the Department of Justice report some of the causes that had led to that moment. Uh, my Twitter feed, which is full of people who follow social movements around the world and who follow things like this, was full of people discussing what was happening because there were people on the ground tweeting about it, and some of the visuals were really striking. There were um, armed personnel carriers, uh, the militarization of the police uh, around the country. So this is suburban US, and we have APCs. There were pictures of people um, that took off people like snipers. They were like, what on earth is going on? And then media itself got really interested, because there's a bunch of people who'd been there, because there had been uh, I think tornadoes, some weather event very nearby. So there was a lot of national news uh, journals who'd been near, and they had just gone there. So we had, you know, Washington Post reporters uh, who were just there, LA Times reporter. And in the middle of all of the striking visuals, a lot of discussion about it, what's going on on social media, two reporters uh, who had been in McDonald's charging and you know, just using Wi-Fi, which I've done around the world when I do protest research, like you're either at wi you're either at Starbucks or McDonald's, because that's where you get Wi-Fi. Uh, they were arrested just out of the blue. Uh, the police came and said, leave. And they're like, what's going on? Because they're reporters. They're not used to being pushed around like that. As we've seen very recently, a Starbucks employee called the police on uh, to black men who had been sort of there. We do this all the time, and nothing happens to most people. The reporters weren't used to just like leave. So they said, why are we supposed to leave? And boom, they were arrested. And they were arrested without being able to tweet they'd been arrested. So all of a sudden, we had somebody else take a picture of um, Ryan and Wesley being stuffed into a police van. At this point, my friends that in Bahrain are like, oh, this is looking familiar. Like, they're tweeting about it. We're kind of like, we know this. This is, um, so given sort of this pr uh, thing going on and given my um, field of study and my personal interest, I went to Facebook to see what my Facebook friends were saying about it. I said, okay, you know, what's going on here? And there was no conversation about it on Facebook. My Facebook feed was full of people talking about the ice bucket challenge. You might remember that. <laughs> Dump water on yourself, ice water, and um, tag some people, challenge them, say you do this next, and you film a video. And it's a good cause. Uh, the money gets to <laughs> donated to ALS research. I'm all for, you know, I, I, I have no problem with that, but my feed was full of people doing this. This is August, right? Hot weather. I said, okay. My Facebook friends haven't, you know, figured this out. So I go back to um, Twitter again, and it's all over my Twitter feed. And I'm like, do I really have that different friends on Facebook and Twitter? Like, everybody on Twitter seems to be talking about it. It's trending. It's like, got all these tweets. and. I go back on Facebook and it's Ice Bucket Challenge and some babies and engagements, my usual Facebook. So I was like, wait, wait. So Facebook algorithmically prioritizes your feed, right? Uh, you have on average 150, 200 uh, Facebook friends, a thousand things perhaps to see a day, perhaps 2,000, depends on how prolific your friends are. So the algorithm picks what to show you. So I went and found in Facebook's buried controls, and to this day it is a buried control, the chronological one. It's, you know, stop, get your algorithm out of the way. Now this is not an easy thing to do. Facebook immediately will take you back. If you're on mobile, it'll just like not even listen to you. Keep trying to do it. It keeps trying to wrest that control back from you. And my friends on Facebook were indeed talking about Ferguson. It's just that Facebook's newsfeed algorithm really liked the ice bucket challenge. It had everything. It was like this algorithm nip, right? It had a lot of likes. At that time, the only signal you could give to the algorithm was a like. Right now, they have these alternatives, but it's still like that's the prominent, the one that's across the web. So that first, that was a bias source positive stuff. Because how do you like the thing that's happening in Ferguson? There's nothing likable about it. The second thing is you are tagging people. Facebook's growth team likes it when you tag people. You know, you're getting engagement. They were liking video. They prioritized video for a long time. And you hear this, like news journalists pivot to video. It just means Facebook's algorithm decided to like video. It doesn't mean anybody else likes video necessarily. Right? So 
at that moment, if we had, like in the Philippines, a Facebook-only public sphere, in a lot of places where there are weaker institutions and you don't have the sort of open mass media, it's absolutely plausible to me that burgeoning social movement would have been smothered from lack of attention, right? Attention is the crucial resource for social movements and for politics. Uh, joint attention is what politics is about. And what's changed in the new public sphere is that it used to be that we conflated public attention with mass media because mass media essentially had a mon monopoly on public attention, right? They are not the same thing. A lot of scholarship on media focuses on mass media part when they actually mean public attention. It is no longer a reasonable conflation because right now mass media, depending on which country you are in, it can be a means of very important joint public attention, but the level of control on it varies. So what had happened is that the new gatekeepers of attention, public attention, like the social media platforms, and that's Facebook, that's YouTube, and to some degree that's Twitter. Depends on which country you are again. Uh, they are largely structured by their business model and some functions of technology, and that has created a very different means of censorship. It's created a means of censorship where you do not necessarily break the link between the person and the information because the Information is harder to block in a network world. It is somewhere out there, right? It's on a website, it's somewhere, it's on a tweet, it's on a Facebook post. But what can indeed be blocked is attention. Attention can be misdirected. Attention can be um, overloaded with information glut. It can be overwhelmed with misinformation. And that's where sort of the whole fake news thing is important. It's not that fake news is this crucial thing. It is that it is a way of drowning out credibility so that you may have access to the information, but you no longer know what is actually going on because you have 10 pieces of information and challenges to credibility and no longer authoritative gatekeepers. I'm not arguing that the old gatekeepers were great. Right? We can give you tons of examples of the problems with the old kinds of gatekeeping, but there was at least a journalism ethos that they failed from. Right? They failed from it often, but there is something to fail from, whereas the business model of Facebook and YouTube is to just to keep you on the site. So there's nothing to fail from. Like we sometimes publicly shame them and they tweak a few things. And that has a lot of consequences for how people access attention. Another thing, I'm going to give a more recent example. Um, if you go on YouTube, as I do, and watch certain things, uh, during the run-up to the election, I watched a lot of Donald Trump rallies. Not a lot, some amount, because I was writing about it. I was writing about um, the burgeoning social movement. I was arguing this was a viable movement that the mass media in its own bubble was not noticing how much legs it had. I was going to his rallies, I was following social media, so I was making an argument to take the candidacy seriously rather than just a joke um, celebrity thing. And as I watched a few of these, YouTube started showing me extremist videos of white supremacists. And I thought maybe this is a correlation, you know? They watch this, they watch that. So I started experimenting. And I started watching um, videos of Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, and I was soon shown conspiracy left <laughs> on the autoplay, right? YouTube has this autoplay. I was like, okay, maybe this is politics, you know, just pushing it here and there. So I was like, let's experiment. I would log out, I would get clean machines, I would start out, and you watch something about being vegetarian, YouTube's like, would you like to watch a video about being vegan? Right? You're never ever hardcore enough for YouTube is my way of uh, ex understanding this. You watch something about jogging and soon YouTube's like ultra marathons, aren't they cool? So what's going on here is a very specific thing that is incredibly important because YouTube, not Wikipedia, not New York Times, YouTube is the source of information around the world. This is where young people go, including here, Chromebooks are half the K-12 education market and they come with YouTube. Uh, everybody, every kid, they, not every kid, but a lot of kids go to YouTube to get information. And YouTube's algorithm, that autoplay algorithm, 
the, it's optimized to keep you on the site to serve you ad after ad. And it's a machine learning algorithm, something specific we can talk about. It has real consequences that it is a machine learning algorithm. It's not something YouTube programmers put in saying, let's destabilize the whole world, right? That's not what's happening. I wish that were the problem. I wish it was a bunch of evil programmers. I would say, go do something else. Um, what has happened is that the algorithm has clearly figured out that just like humans have uh, food appetites, like we have a craving for sugar, salt, and fat, which is perfectly reasonable during the Pleistocene where there are no supermarkets. So you're evolved to crave certain things. Now we're in an environment where you can get all the ones you want and you have the food industry. You have corporate agriculture, big agriculture, food industry, everything. That is going to pump you with as much sugar, salt, and fat as they can because, you know, it'll just sort of up your um, what you want and they'll sell you the stuff. And that's not really been good for uh, our health. In the information world, the counterpart to that is that people, especially young people, have natural curiosity. The healthy version of this is the scientific curiosity. They want to know what adults are keeping from them. Political dissidents want to know what's being secret. Uh, we want to understand, and being edgier is attractive, right? It's seductive. Something like, you know, ultra marathon is more interesting than the jogging. Um, you have that friend in college. You listen to heavy metal, they listen to trash metal. You listen to trash metal, they listen to death metal, right? There's always this out edging. YouTube's algorithm has figured this out for people. It's figured this out through machine learning that if you keep feeding people extremist content, more extreme content, I don't mean, you know, sort of radical in some philosophically grounded way. Whatever you are, something edgier. This is the environment in which people stay on the site longer. BuzzFeed, uh, after I wrote about this, a bunch of people did some higher, like sort of big data-ish uh, analysis, and BuzzFeed found that in, if you start anywhere political, within about three or so autoplays, you end up with Alex Jones. <laughs> Alex Jones is entertaining, Alex Jones is edgy, uh, also immensely cruel, and a lot of fakery. So this is the particular moment in which we have a public sphere where misinformation, information glut, challenge of credibility, misdirecting of information, and uh, sort of mis um, managing people's attention is the big threat. This is the environment in which things like fake news are one slice of this larger phenomenon because there's a science paper that looks at fake news on Twitter, and one key reason seems to be novelty. Novelty is interesting, and fake stuff are necessarily more interesting than reality, which tends to be more boring and mundane. And that creates an environment in which, even if you're not on Facebook, this is, uh, I'm going to conclude, I get this a lot, people, there's a lot of people who are not on Facebook, and what about Fox News? This is the sort of question I get. Here's the thing, though, even if, you're talking about some elderly person who's only watching Fox News, and you say, what about that? Fox News is competing with Breitbart on Facebook. Okay? Fa Fox News is part of this ecology. If there is Breitbart that is making some claims that's getting more attention, Fox News is coverage shifts. Breitbart is competing with those Macedonian teenagers that are creating the faker news. The ecology itself is pulling to the edge and it doesn't really matter where you are in the ecology. You are going to be pulled if your business model is attention. And your business model also has to be reaching readers. And that's sort of, a lot of people dismiss fake news because, you know, there's all these other things. Well, it's part of the whole thing. Of it's, it's an indicator of ecology. And my final thing is, she tweeted about me because I tweeted about her talk. I'm already getting trolled from the Philippine side. <laughs> uh, it's my world, too. I'm from, you know, where I am. And this is how it operates. Like five years ago, I could go on social media and say, let me find something out about places even I know. Right now, if I go, there's so much misinformation, even from places I know by heart that I should be able to figure out. I can't figure things out anymore, and I'm pretty well informed and good at sort of this kind of triangulation. So these are the challenges that I look forward to talking about. Thank you.
Thank you so much for those four uh, really wonderful talks. Um, it sounds like our challenge is how to get us to eat our vegetables, as it were, instead of binging on the sugars and salts of fake media. And yet at the same time, we've also learned about these incredible tools that Sam laid out for us in which um, digital tools can be incredibly um, liberatory and work for social justice. Um, maybe not, they're not spinach, but they're, they are um, definitely delectable and it was wonderful to see that. I'd love to just open up the floor for commenters questions, please remember to briefly say your name um, before you ask your question. Yes, please, in the striped shirt. Uh, Susan Douglas, University of Michigan. Um, I have a question for the panel, but especially for Amy and uh, Zenith. I've uh, gotten very concerned about the way in which CNN and MSNBC are covering this presidency as if it's celebrity journalism. Who dissed who? Who's on the outs? Um, whose feelings were hurt, all that, you know, and it's all Trump or Pruitt or whatever all the time. And one worries if we actually had a different president in 2020, somebody a little less flamboyant, maybe less corrupt. Um, I have the news, do, uh, and this, and I hate speculation in the news as well, but I think we're at such a, a crucial point here. On the one hand, there is investigative journalism, but on the other hand, there's all of this hyperventilating, right, about Trump. And I'm wondering what you think about where the media might be if you get a slightly more boring, maybe policy wonk kind of president in, in 2021, and can the media pivot back to something prior to all of this? Because what you've been raising is very concerning. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't view this right now as a Republican versus Democrat construct in our country. I think this is a battle for um, democracy versus becoming an authoritarian state. But I think our media is still back covering this Republican democracy. And um, so I think it's a problem that they have gotten so much better, like we, only because they've been thoroughly embarrassed by saying Trump read a speech off a teleprompter and now he's presidential you know, 10 times and having to eat their lunch the next day. But they still have a ways to go in, in sort of telling the story that needs to be told, which is what's happening to our democracy and our values. And, um, I, and they still are trying to cover him and go to these basically propaganda sessions with the press secretary where no information is being given that's of any value. Um, and they're covering him like a celebrity president. So in, in answer to your question, I, I think a lot of Americans are like screaming inside their heads of what the coverage looks like. But if you really work towards it, you can find what you need to do. Um, the, the, the investigative reporters, um, I think the Washington Post is, is, is doing a great job of covering things broadly, like a lot of the local stories and nationally. Uh, but where our media fails us is, yes, the, the ratings, the excitement around a, a not normal man and not really covering the stories that need to be to told because they're trying to get the best ratings. Um, I think after this all, and I get this question a lot, like what will it look like when this regime falls? Uh, I think there's going to be a readjustment of so many things. One is understanding that we thought uh, you know, we learned in high school history that there were checks and balances in our country, and they're really, those were norms, not laws. And so I think we're going to have to reconstruct a lot of things, including our journalistic coverage of, and what that should look like. And I think it's a story that needs to be told, but I, there's too much, and, and you can especially see it, and, and though, you know, you, you're all better, much more experts than I am on so, the actual use of social media, but there's too much of these cocoons within social media of everyone in the media, like everyone from MSNBC retweeting each other and CNN and everybody's pals and then they go on their shows and they say the same thing and they're missing so many of the important stories and storylines as a result. So maybe one question is, can we ever get a policy wonk president in a public sphere where, um, you need to get the attention. So the thing I will say is that, now, when you make the food analogy, it does sound like, how do we make people eat their vegetables, which doesn't sound great. Um, it sounds like we're going to force feed them broccoli. Um, the thing, the challenge here is, 
and I don't have an answer in my back pocket, obviously, is that you have to create news and journalism that is appealing to people. I mean, there's just no two ways around this. This is not, like, you're not going to go back to the old gatekeepers. People are not going to just be force-fed stuff. Uh, so how do you create this intersection where you're doing serious stuff and you are getting people interested in it? This is a long-term project. I think there are very good examples of this. I see this all the time, you know, well-written stories and things like that. And the kind of, um, Let's give an example. Let's give a, like the worst example is probably what's his name, the fix guy, the Chris Crisella. That oh. he's not at CNN. He seems to have no way to. He can fail as upwards as possible. He invented the um, who won, who lost format, right? And which is incredibly damaging. Jay Rosen writes about that a lot. Like it's really been horrible. It's because it's this inside baseball thing. On the some way. That's an attractive format because it appeals to the same thing that appeals to our sports fandom, right? We get fandom and we get, you know, it's kind of an interesting format except it's very hollow and damaging because you don't get policy. So can there be a version of that format that does substantive stuff? I don't know, right? I, maybe the format is not suitable to that, but it has a way of getting people's attention even if people get mad at it. So how do you deal with a question like that where like, even if you hate something, and you're kind of hate tweeting about it, the algorithm's like, ooh, engagement, right? Uh, so this is a problem for the new public sphere. And the second thing I want to say is that we've kind of been in places like this before, right? We have a, the other example I like to give is that film started, uh, and the early craft, the best craft of film includes a lot of fascist filmmakers or filmmakers who are in the service of fascism or uh, racism, right? You, in the US, you have the birth of a nation, which invented half the kind of movie conventions you have. Uh, if you ever watch ESPN, half the shots, they're invented by Leni Riefenstahl, who was filming um, the Munich Olympics, and then the triumph of the will, the crane shot, the, the hero shot, making he Hitler charismatic. Um, so there's a lot of ways a new medium can be in the kind of service of authoritarians. And then after World War II, in the US, a lot of the sort of universities were flooded with people who had fled fascism either before or right after. Uh, and there was this enormous amount of thinking about anti-authoritarianism as a project, right? There was a, a public education as part of it, critical thinking as a part of it. Uh, Fred Turner's book, um, uh, the, the late, his latest book kind of documents this period. And at the moment, if you show triumph of the will to people, we would roll our eyes. There are ways in which we are accustomed to blunt advertisements, so we have new kinds of manipulation. There are ways in which we've kind of developed a set of institutions. We moved from yellow journalism to the current ethos, which journalism fails from, but at least it fails from something. So the question is, how do we create a public sphere and a set of tools and a set of institutions that deals with how compatible the current public sphere is with authoritarianism, and hopefully do it before you know back-to-back -back world wars uh, scare the living lights out of our <laughs> uh, everyone, including our elites. Right after World War II, you have this really scary moment where our elites and including our sort of leaders, everybody comes together and said, "How do we not go through this again?" And within 20 years, you have the European Union, you have this, you have that, you have a bunch of things. Not perfect, but it's really an enormous progress considering what just happened. So can we do this without it getting that bad? Is I see a bunch question. of questions out there. Thank you so much for that. But I want to make sure that Sam and Maria also jump in and then we'll. Can I quickly uh, on that one? I think you, so I really long for the old days. Uh, but we have to, we're now separating form and distribution, right? The, the message and distribution, that's separated. That's never been that way before, and that's a huge difference. The gatekeepers to, to information are now the platforms, and they've chosen mob rule as the guiding principle. And so one of the, the first questions we should be asking really is, in, in many ways, it plays to the worst of human nature, our cognitive bias. Uh, it's, it's literally rewiring our brain. So it's fundamentally changing the way we think. So even thinking, we're pancake people. So even the old forms of journalism 
you wouldn't get people to watch it, right? And Zainab kind of talked about that. So I think th there's this new definition. It's not creative destruction anymore. It's beyond that. And whatever this thing is, we have to redefine what the world is. The second is it's connected to power. I mean, this is not just the, the media talking amongst ourselves, trying to just do ratings. This is manipulated in a global geopolitical power struggle, and it is changing power structures globally. What we're seeing in each of our countries, really fascinating to hear everybody, is, is only the tip of the iceberg because we are seeing uh, changes in the way the power structures of the world are being done because of the exponential powers of these platforms. Um, South China Sea, Korea, right? Uh, the US role in a global market, all of this stuff has changed. Was Trump led there because of the disinformation uh, on social media? These are all questions that we have. And then finally, I think that uh, you have to go back and look. Right now, not one journalist, not one news organization or one organization can actually flip a switch. But, two, um, but the American companies who are running these algorithms can. It is in their hands, right? So long-term solution, obviously education. Medium-term, media literacy. Short-term is only Google, Facebook, right? Uh, if you really look at that, they control. I mean, even if you, journalists are getting killed on both ends. Um, the two platforms are taking 80 to 90 percent of the of the new digital ad spend in any country around the world. In the Philippines, it's 85 percent. It went from 72 percent to 85 percent. At the same time, those are the platforms that are being used, manipulated by power players to break down trust in institutions, in organizations, in media. The surveys also show that if you're prone to believe in these conspiracy theories, which the algorithms are pushing you to believe, you are less prone to believe in facts. So, new world. Yeah, same. Um, so I'll say two things. One, just want to emphasize how Im incredibly important and consequential it is that this administration has managed to shift the conversation to be all about, uh, you know, the personal relationships between Trump and everybody else. Um, you know, in, in the context of police reform, we saw a national conversation for several years under the Obama administration, which led to laws being signed in 30 states to address uh, some aspect of police reform. Uh, all of that progress halted the moment that Trump got in office. The only conversation that's happened has been a conversation about Trump. Every other issue, every other concern has perhaps created a day or two window of conversation. It has not created a sustained conversation because this administration has so stifled uh, the oxygen in the room, taken out the oxygen in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and that has real consequences for all the issues that we care about. It has consequences. We see this in uh, the progress of legislation in, in various states. We see this in cities. Um, so, so real consequences. I think the second piece is to emphasize that the platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, it, you know, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, like these platforms actually can, can decide to disrupt that. And in many cases, they're deciding not to. And that is not a, that is a conscious decision. I remember I was in a meeting with uh, Sheryl Sandberg and others at Facebook. Um, and, you know, I, I asked, you know, does Facebook as a platform value inclusion and equity? Oh. And she had, she didn't have a response, right? You know, somebody who literally her platform is all about inclusion and equity, and yet her platform is not, right? Um, and I think that's a choice, right? It is a choice to just allow uh, the algorithm to radicalize people in these incredibly dangerous and harmful ways um, because it makes them a little bit more money. And I think they could make a different choice. Um, and we should be holding the executives there accountable, not just saying, you know, there's a capitalist economy, they're going to do whatever makes the most money, and that's fine, because that is literally allowing this to only get worse. And nothing that we do, nothing that any individual news organization does is going to correct that system and the way that, that ecosystem uh, is working. Um, and I think we see with Twitter, for example, uh, they have started to take some measures uh, where they're looking more systemically at the platform and how the platform contributes to this. Facebook has made you know, smaller corrections. 
Um, but I think more pressure needs to be put on them from the media, from everybody that has uh, a platform, because that is what will, what will change this. Thanks, Sam. We have a question here. Connection of all these international uh, journalistic um, sort of contexts. I joined the program from Syria. So a lot of the things, Amy, that you were writing in your list, I recognized distinctly. And I was like, well, this is not new. It just kind of, I brought it with me somehow. Um, but I was, right? I was really worried about that. I was some sort of curse on the left. But I was, I was starting to think as we were speaking about the fact that these kind of practices are not new. So is there an effort made by journalists today to go back and think, some people have been dealing with this forever. What are people in Syria doing? What are journalists in you know, Damascus doing, um, Douma? Like the people who are in these areas that are being gassed, they're still journalists and they're still doing very relevant stuff. Is there a com like conversation going on between journalists around the world on how they fight a sweep of authoritarianism that's not just in one country. Yeah, and, and that, you know, in answer to the last question, the same thing, like they are still trying to cover this. And, and I throw this out at my book events, like rhetorically, what is the Republican Party's platform for the next six months? None, because basically we have one person ruling our country right now. It's actually come to that, that it, he's recreated our government into the Trump organization, and he's surrounded by 20 sycophants, and anyone who doesn't agree with him, McMaster, Cohn, they're all thrown out the door. And so our policy can switch three or four times in a week, depending on his mood and what his friends tell him to do. And our media, that's the story, that we have basically one person in charge and the checks and balances aren't working, but instead they're trying to cover him, oh, why did he change his mind on tariffs? You know, like that's all, like, so it's all really titillating that the New York Times and the Washington Post want to tell us he's angry today, he's sad today, he's da da da. Like that's all like really interesting and then everyone's chasing around like, oh, what kind of mood is he in? But like yeah. the story is what is happening, which is there is one person running our country and he decided last week to bomb Syria on a Friday and in week 21 of my list, which was 53 weeks before, he bombed Syria. And why did he bomb Syria? Because he was getting negative coverage and he wanted to get positive coverage, which the media then gave him for acting like he was in control. And then he did the mother of all bombs that week as well. So yeah, they're, they're failing and I wish they would take your advice and read up about the way authoritarian regimes cover. Uh, you know, because it's, the same things are happening and not at a slow pace either in terms of intimidating people in the media, in terms of them getting threats. I've, I've had to have police sleep outside my house with guns, <laughs> not police, but security for, I mean, this is, you know, this is very real and happening in our country. So. All right, can I say one thing about the what they, the, the big demand I get, and this is the intersection again with the technology. Because we're stuck in the old model of censorship, most anti-censorship tools you have that are developed by technologists are circumvention. How do you get around blocks, internet blocks? Now, this is not a bad idea to have tools like that. It's, you know, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna exclude China from this conversation, but I think it's also part of it. The number one ask I've had for years, for a long, long time, from activists, journalists, everybody, is verification tools. Yeah. They do not want circumvention tools. That's a solved problem. I've been going around for years begging technologists. I've been begging the Tor people. I've been begging other people and saying, great, you know, you've got this internet roots around censorship stuck in your head. I would like, and I'm conveying what is necessary, is this integration into um, my smartphone into Twitter platform, a way in which I can cryptographically sign a photograph so that it is authenticated as on or after a particular date and a location. You know, verificate, it doesn't, it needs to be sort of this automatic thing that is widely recognized because verification and credibility is the new anti-censorship. And that's what's missing. So I think the old conceptual models are holding back some of the things you need, because every time I see something from Syria, every thing, uh, time I see places, the first thing that happens to me is somebody claims, oh, it's from Gaza. It's not that. Sometimes activists make a mistake. It is from Gaza and not Syria. It's this thing. At this point, you can no longer really tell which is which based on any credible set of facts. You have certain prior beliefs, and you believe them or not. I mean, this is 
this is the problem. So what is the new verification? What is the new authentication? Um, Ivan and Ellery are in the room. Global Voices does a bunch of that. Global Voices, like, I can go to there and say, okay, this makes sense. I've got a bunch of people that I trust that are creating this kind of crowdsourced verification. We need technological component to it because it's not getting the word out, once again, authenticating, and we don't really have the tools we need for that. But why wouldn't you expect the platforms to have to, have to be, to do that? Why wouldn't, shouldn't we demand that of them? We should, and it's also a technological challenge uh, because you want to, like, it's a mixture of building the institutions, like, because you need the people, and it's also a mix of building the tools because GPS can be spoofed, blah, 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 uh, and Ivan is like, yeah, because <laughs> they do that. There, there are attempts to do that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Ivan Sigal, I'm uh, Global Voices. And so the Credibility Coalition is trying to do that, schema.org as well, they're trying to build, um, trying to build credibility indices for news. There are challenges with that as well, there, and without getting super deep into it, the biggest one is that, um, as we heard last night, the, the people doing the analysis are mostly American. Most of the analysis is in English. And most of the potential beneficiaries um, initially are ma large mass media companies. So if it's if the credibility those kinds of credibility indicators are created in the wrong way, they privilege some kinds of people with certain with people with aspect ac access to certain kinds of language skills <laughs> or education or access to platforms versus um, the web more broadly. And um, but that that kind of effort is happening, and we need to be super attentive to who gets to create them. Maria, I want to make sure you also get to comment on that. I mean, your experience founding a small company in the Philippines seems to directly like be an, a, an effort to address this kind of issue. Well, so again, I, I believed, I drank the Kool-Aid at the beginning, right? I actually, it was extremely empowering at the beginning, yeah. and we were able to fight against established huge media organizations and, and do well, but... Um, the, I, I, I go back to a pivotal moment, which is 2015, and I, again, because Facebook is the, is the one where you have 2.3 billion people on it, right, or accounts. Um, when news came in there, that fundamentally changed our world. And when you use mob rule as the way you determine what facts are, it's like they built a house and you gave everyone guns and whoever gets, kills the other side wins, right? So. I guess it's interesting listening to everyone about it, but I think, please, Ivan, you talked about the bias that could be built in. The bias is there, and it is against developing countries. It is against the global south. So while Mark Zuckerberg testifies in the U.S. Congress and talks about five to ten years before you can actually deal with this, I'm just thinking in my part of the world, in the global south, five to ten years, people are dying. There's a difference, right? I mean, institutions in the United States, much as it's horrible in, in some ways, are strong enough. You're not, um, in other parts of the world, there's ethnic so cleansing far. So, so far, far, right? So you, you, we're such a bright, optimistic group right now. Um, <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I push back on it to say American platforms America, which stood for democracy and empowerment, is actually now exporting something that goes against its fundamental values. And um, while we're talking about the kinds of potential biases that are there, uh, the biggest bias is already in it, working in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka, in the Philippines, in Indonesia. Um, and we need help. Yeah, I have a question here first. Yeah, Ryerson, an independent journalist in New York. So glad to be here. Thank you for your panel. Um, yes, on this point, I, um, I have a question for you, Samuel. Um, in your work and the risks that you showed us as um, in digital activism, um, you know, when the FBI showed up on your doorstep, it so clearly shows how law enforcement is failing to be a regulator, as Soraya laid out last night, and also the platforms are failing to regulate. So do you see, uh, do you have any strategies that are to counter, to, to regulate um, activist approaches. So I'm curious, like, literally what happened? How did you convince the FBI 
that that was a screenshot fake post, and sort of beyond that incident, how do you um, counter this sort of larger alt-right reframing of your work as bringing an army to the RNC? Um, and it occurs to me, I wonder, sort of in conversation with Amy's work, if there's a need to almost create your own like record keeping of like your digital trail of your activism as a counter to these um, false projections. Yeah, um, so a couple things. One, I think for any activists, particularly now, um, you need to take particular precautions about how you do work. Um, you know, I was fortunate I wasn't home when the FBI showed up. So I get a call, no caller ID uh, on my phone. I uh, turn on my phone and said, this is agent so-and-so, field district office, San Francisco, I'm at your door, are you here to talk? So I didn't know if this was real or not, so I was like, okay, um, what do you want to talk about? I'm here to discuss your upcoming plans for the Republican National Convention. So I go, so I literally on the phone, I'm having to explain to him why this is fake. And if you actually saw, you know, it was kind of far away, if you actually saw the, the photoshopped tweets, it is so obvious that they are fake. So first of all, they're in a font that Twitter DMs aren't in. <laughs> they are points where you can tell that there was like a copy and paste job because you can see like the dots on the eye where there was no eye. Um, it was probably the worst Photoshop job I've ever seen and still that was the response. Um, so I, I literally had to break that down. I had to explain why I wasn't descending on the Republican National Convention with 10,000 people, uh, which was wild. And so then I go, so, so I go, okay, so please leave your business card on the door and when I get home we can, uh, you know, I'll, I'll contact you again. Um, sure enough, there it is, the FBI business card, um, and I never contacted again. Um, so I, I would say, one, I think we need to be really cautious as activists. Um, so after that, I never tell anybody, like my address, I never tell anybody where I'm going to be before I'm there, um, and that is because uh, one time it was advertised where me and my colleague were going to be in a theater screening the Black Panther documentary and a bomb threat was called. Um, when we were there. Um, so, so I think as an actor, we use Signal and other uh, secure communications platforms. All of that is really important, like covering the cameras on your computer. Um, so as individuals, those are the precautions we can take. I think more systemically, it's very difficult because, you know, this, that was under the Obama administration. Under this FBI, who knows, right? Um, and so, so I don't know. I, I don't know what more we can do as individuals, as activists. I think it is important to have, to be very transparent about everything that we do because in where there are questions, those will be filled by fake news. Um, and so, so, you know, how we go about, you know, creating policies and, and where that comes from and, and, you know, funding and where that comes from, like all of that um, it needs to be as tra transparent as possible. Um, Beyond that, I don't have any, I, I wish I had like answers. I think this is just the, the world that we live in. Right, I have a question here in the black shirt. Hi, my name is Soraya Shemalian. Um, I wanted to touch specifically on this issue of verification and authentication. Um, because I, I have also worked with these companies for a long time now, Facebook and Twitter and Google, and it's such a double-edged sword, largely because of the issues that we're talking about, but really this divide between Silicon Valley's culture and the rest of the world, because we work with a lot of women um, and, and activists who cannot be geolocated. That's like a dire danger when they're taking photographs, where they're actually on the ground. And so this um, issue of even something that to some of us seems straightforward, like the verification of identity, is endangering to people. It's also really calibrated to um, Western ideas about what constitutes verification. So I have one Facebook executive actually suggest to a group of women writers in India that really they could just come with a club membership card, and that would be sufficient. And it was kind of gobsmacking to have this conversation. And so. Um, the additional risk to verification also is that it has traditionally um, empowered the status quo. And so the same 
hierarchical imbalances that we know exist within these institutions, whether it's media or technology or sports, pick an industry, get replicated at scale, and then those become nodes of harassment and aggression. So that's what happened, for example, with the verification of conservative pundits who were weaponized through Gamergate and then into Pizzagate and into the election. Um, so I hesitate to say these are just good ideas because I know that they're really fraught. Especially for women, I will add again, because verifying a woman puts her in the line of fire of harassment in a way that verifying a man doesn't. Um, and that's um, also documented because it shows very visibly with the little blue check mark that she has higher status and then armies of racist, misogynist trolls come out to make her life a living hell. So I think that this idea that we need civil society advocates to work with these tech companies. Um, and honestly, we need international input because American exceptionalism pervades our responses. And activists here have so much to learn from activists around the world. And that kind of exchange has been invaluable to us. Thank you so, so much So it's not really a question because I really empathize with what you're saying. But everything you're describing um, to me um, is so important to <coughs> Could I add to that? So our data actually shows that women are targeted at least three times yeah. more and the kind of exponential increase of racist and misogynistic, actually it's sexist in the Philippines, it's, it's, it's sexist and misogynistic. Uh, and they're students. networked globally. So networked, so exactly. Are coming from all over. So yes, uh, and the, the women are the women critical female voices in the Philippines? And again, I, I can. This is backed by data. We can we can share that. Sam, did you want to respond at all? Um, yeah, I think you know to your point about sharing with other activists, uh, that was a big part of what was happening in Twitter during the Ferguson uprising. We saw uh, protesters learning from. Uh, folks in Palestine, how to respond to tear gas, how to treat yourself, you know, uh, all of that has been, that information exchange has been really important and it goes again to the importance of how the platforms are designed. Um, so, you know, we heard about the difference between Twitter and Facebook and what you see. Um, you know, those are decisions with the way that Twitter is structured is structured to put everybody around the world in the same conversation around something that they care about, represented by that hashtag, which means if you are, you know, low income in Detroit and you and you are impacted by police violence, you're suddenly able to be in a conversation about that with everybody else around the world who's talking about it at that time. In a way that Facebook, you're in a conversation with your friends. Uh, and your friends may not have reach, they may not have a platform, they may not have resources, they may not have tips from Palestine about how to deal with tear gas. Um, so it's just a, a fundamentally different structure of the platform and one is liberatory and the other reinforces existing uh, social hierarchies. Um, and those, those are decisions made by, you know, developers and Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and, you know, people who probably weren't thinking about how that simple design structure would have tremendous implications for social movements. Um, but that's the kind of thinking that we have to demand for people who are going to enter that sector and design these platforms to come. Right. So There's I'm going to, I want to add something because this is something that's very near and dear my heart for obvious reasons that I've been struggling with for uh, ever since the real names policy argument in Facebook broke out. There's, there are these trade-offs that need to be discussed. There is, I mean, as a pretty high profile public person from Turkey, I, this is something I deal with all the time. And there are ways in which you can have a, re like this is not the picture verification because picture verification is a different thing than identity verification. Uh, and I make this argument in my book, but I was arguing this before. I think there are ways in which there are trade-offs between activist safety and ecology health uh, that come from the verification thing. You know, I, I, it's a story I write in my book of a pretty high-risk activist who had um, family members killed who uh, was very, very happy to get verification and any kind of endorsement because he could then get publicity. And I'm like, you're putting your life on the risk here. And he was like, I know, but this is what I, like, I'm putting my life on the risk. I might as well get results, right? Without the verification part, without the authentication, you're putting your life on the risk and you're not getting the results. I don't know if there's a way out of this trade-off because um, pseudonymous platforms like Twitter 
have been more easily weaponized. I know countries where people will only connect with you politically if you can give them a Facebook ID and they go check your Facebook because it's a little easier to check that you're an actual person rather than a government agent. And because if you're in social movement, there's informants. Right? There's somebody who's a government agent, so being a real person isn't enough. On the other hand, if you're in a real name environment, there are ways in which you can be targeted. Right? Does anybody need a Muslim registry when you got Facebook data? Right? So there's this, there's this real issue that is very thorny. And I think there's certain things the platforms could do better to offer certain levels, but I think there are these structural trade-offs too that we have to have this big conversation about how do we protect people while also keeping in mind what they're trying to do, which is to get attention. And there's no way to be a political dissident getting attention in an authoritarian country and being safe. There's no technological or political solution to this. Great. We have quite a queue of questions. So I'm going to bundle three. I see one, Lydia in the back, three. If you could say your name, ask your question, and we'll ask the panel to respond to them as a group. Sure. My name is Ellery. I'm the advocacy director of Global Voices. And I wanted to ask, Maria and Sam, if you could talk about, I mean, facing all of these threats and harassment and trolling that is part and parcel of this work, the longer term effects of that on the work itself and on the degree to which, especially when you're working with a staff, and Maria, you've been in this for decades, I mean, people get tired. And this is, in our community, something we've seen a lot, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, where in 2011, the Global Voices community couldn't get enough. They're just working so hard and doing so much. And it is so different now. And it is, it's, it's like things change over time. And I just, I wondered if you could just talk about how do you think about that in terms of actually the media you're creating? And, and where does the risk and all of these threats actually start to no, where is the impact there? Lydia? Hi, I'm Lizzie Paxton, University of Pennsylvania. Samuel, I have a question for you about, about how you do the accounting. Um, I noticed that both your site and uh, the guardians that count it, but your site to a much lesser extent, count female victims of domestic homicide um, when the uh, killer is a police officer. I wonder, I would really be interested, and I remember what reading the Guardian's account when that project started, and I remember the first time I encountered that as one of the captured cases, having this moment of thinking, there are pluses and there are losses when we count domestic violence in this particular kind of count. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on what is gain and what's loss when we add that in. Hi, I'm Nikki Escher, George Washington University slash University of Illinois. Um, I had a, a question for all of you. Um, I wanted, it's easy to get very dark, right, as you, you all pointed out. I want to hear something that you think worked to fight the structure um, at sort of post-Trump administration. So if you've got just even a small example of something that worked, I'd love to hear that. Great question. Maybe we can start by inviting you to start there, and then we'll circle back to the questions of domestic violence and global voices. You want to start, Amy? Oh, sure. I'll start. So uh, I get asked, since I cover the not normal things, like Trump must have done something good since he took office. And my answer is he's sprung the two largest social movements um, of my lifetime. <laughs> and I, I run a national women's organization in addition to doing this list. And progress has generally been linear and slow. And now it's like a bonfire. So the American people, I think when this started, there were two choices. It could have been like the Naomi Shulman poem where we watched as they paraded the Jews down the street, which now might be the undocumented immigrants or the, or the Muslims. But instead, our country has an uprising. And we've had over a million people march um, two consecutive times, which got very little media coverage. Another problem with our media, why um, the resistance is not like a defined term 
in the same way that, like, if you could get 20 white men into a room eight years ago when Obama was president, the Tea Party, you know, that would be front page news. But there is an active resistance happening in our country that if you compare us to, say, um, I happen to be in, in the Netherlands um, in the fall, how, how slowly that country came to terms and resisted what was happening with Hitler and how quickly juxtapose not only the women's movement but our teenagers who are now um, going to get to the polls next in, in 2018. So I think the good news story is we're fighting for our democracy and, and we'll prevail. Um, but I, you know, I think we're at the same time seeing then the flaws that existed and hopefully there will be good that comes of that in terms of ways to fix it. Yeah, so on that question around good things, uh, no, no, no. yes. Not good things, what works. Tools. What works, yes. What <laughs> work from your individual slash your, yeah. your, your, your efforts. So. Cool, so one of the things that worked um, was effectively finding pathways to crowdsource all of the energy uh, that's, that's happened across the country since Trump got elected. I think there's a, a huge potential here, hundreds of millions of people who want to do something. And if we can just build something that focuses that energy at a particular time and a particular place, we can make real change. The problem is coordinating all of that complexity. Um, so one example is, you know, in Florida, we uh, partnered with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, which is which got a, a measure on the ballot there that would end the state's disenfranchisement law. Um, Florida has disenfranchises more people than any other state, 1.6 million people, about 40% of black men in the state of Florida are permanently banned from voting because of this law, which was adopted in 1868 specifically to disenfranchise black people. Um, we, what we were able to do was create a platform that allowed people to donate, uh, for every dollar they donated, we mailed two petitions to Florida registered voters. Uh, we needed, it was a total of 700,000 petitions needed to be signed. The Florida Rights Restoration Coalition was doing the on-the-ground organizing, uh, and we were able to sort of be sort of like the Air Force, and we were able to crowdfund uh, enough money to send 133,000 petitions uh, in the space of only, you know, a few weeks to Florida registered voters. Um, because people all across the country, first of all, cared about this as you cared about voting rights, number two, understood Florida and the fact that that law has specifically uh, been used to disenfranchise enough people to impact presidential elections, to impact Senate elections, to impact the governorship, the House, like all of that is, is influenced by this law. Um, and people created a pathway for people to contribute if they didn't live in the state. Uh, and that's how we were able to do that. I think creating other things like that that have real impact, not just you know sign this petition online that doesn't go anywhere, but like send real petitions that change policy and law. I think when we can make those real connections, I think we can make a big difference. Um, I think the second question around um, people who are killed in instances of domestic violence when the, the person, the killer is a police officer. We do count those in our uh, database. Every year it's uh, about five or 10 cases like that uh, that we're able to identify. Um, we include it because you know, police violence is broad and impacts people in different ways. And we know that police officers are more likely uh, to be involved in domestic violence. Um, and we know that women are disproportionately impacted by that. Uh, and often in the conversation about police violence, it is a conversation about, uh, you know, 95% of people killed by police are men. Um, and so it becomes a male-centered conversation, and the ways in which police violence impacts women is often missed. Uh, number one, because those cases are excluded from databases like the Washington Post database. And number two, because non-fatal police violence, there's simply not data on that at a national level. Um, so we have the tip of the iceberg, but if you're talking about sexual assault, sexual harassment, there's no national database of that, and surely that would be much more frequent than 1,200 cases a year. Um, and so we try to the best extent possible to include uh, those cases. I wonder if maybe Maria and or Zainab, you want to talk about particularly tools to combat what, what I think people are increasingly calling the homogenous, you know, this dampening of global voices, global English all the time, um, ways to introduce maybe less heard voices, um, tools you have found p p particularly useful. Well, that is still, I think, pretty hard. I mean, I individually try my best, but it, it really is a challenge. I want to go back to Nikki's question a little bit about what works. Uh, my 
book's title is The Power and Fragility of Network Protest. The whole argument is that you scale up really fast with social media and you're entering your first big movement at 100 miles an hour without a steering wheel, right? This is a different thing from protests in the past where it took a lot of movement building before you could have a big protest. Right now you can go from Facebook post to Women's March in three months, right? And that's both a power and that's the thing. So what I'm finding right now is that like I wrote a lot of examples of that. Now I'm looking into, um, I'm going around the country, I'm traveling here, who knew I would have a movement to study here, <laughs> like this. And one of the really interesting things for me is that um, it is like not what I've seen elsewhere. There's this real emphasis on organizational infrastructure building in a way that I had not seen a lot of places. Part of it is learning, right? When you go like, boom, I can reach millions of people. Uh, the weaknesses of the social media field movement model become apparent at some cost, yeah. right? Yeah. You fail and you learn from it. And for us, it meant a lot of friends in jail, a lot of countries in civil war, but you know, you learn. Um, so the second thing that I've seen is the, is the learning. People have learned that you don't just do that. That's important. The second thing that's interesting that I think that works in this particular movement is how many of this resistance groups, indivisibles, other things I've seen are not just sort of the young people who are in the movement phase, which is great. I was there, uh, we, like, I was a foolish young person, so I'm gonna sort of take it personally, but there's a way in which youth energy is awesome, but there's a way in which that it is youth energy, right? It comes with all the youth energy things that I did in my own time. Um, the current movement in the US has a large number of uh, women, and especially middle-aged women, uh, if you look at sociology, women do the work of kinship, network building, they're like the sort of so socialization-wise, the organization building, uh, s both learning and uh, working seems to be there. And in terms of the tech tools, I'll just give you guys one example, um, is that I'm following this effort, uh, it's called Tech Solidarity, it's not even a big effort, uh, trying to get um, Silicon Valley, San Francisco people who work in tech who have nobody to really vote for. They live in San Francisco. There's not that much to do, and it's not like they're really good organizationally. There are a couple of districts in California they could maybe do something, is that there's these efforts to funnel money and some tech expertise from them to movements. There's one in Lancaster, Lancaster Stands Up, I'm following, I'll, I'll go there on Sunday, um, that is really grassroots organization building, field building, that I don't think we've seen in this country which is because the moment we're at isn't just some you know, celebrity president, it is the result of decades of elite failure. It's mass media failure, institutional failure, government failure, Iraq war, inequality, you, know, you, don't, you can't just, like we can't bring back our elites because they brought us here, right? It's their failure and I'm now seeing movements that are neither sort of just elite driven in this country, nor are they trying to replicate it. They're trying to find a new way. To me, that's really interesting because, I mean, I'm sorry, I write for the New York Times, but bringing back the New York Times obviously is not going to solve this issue because thank, this is how, partly how we got here. Uh, Nikki, I want to answer your question because I did find hope, and, I, and I'll also give the hope part of this, right? So uh, for us, uh, there's this great paper, a 2014 paper called The Menace of Unreality. It's by Peter Pomerantsev and Michael Weiss. And one of the things they actually pointed out there is how unprepared the West is to deal with this. And they predicted that it would roll out, and it did. So part of where I was getting some guidance is the Ukraine. Uh, they started collecting data from 2014 to 2016. That was why we started collecting data the minute I saw something weird going on. And uh, uh, I, I spent a lot of time talking to folks in the Ukraine who've actually been able to, to push back, right, and to reclaim it. Vikontakte, of course, was banned, so let's not talk that. Here's what's worked in the Philippines. Um, uh, shine the light. 
we we when we ex when we exposed the propaganda machine i just tweeted it uh, you can look at that that was mid 2016 when we started looking at these numbers and uh, you know the exponential spread 26 fake accounts could hit 3 million others this is like on a whole different scale uh, so so going out that got us attacked but at this and then here's the attack 90 hate messages per hour 98 messages per hour, and that was for me personally, right? So I sat there and go, did I do something wrong? Um, is it real? Do I respond? I try to respond, but then the more you get hammered, right? So then that's that, so in August then we did a hashtag, no place for hate, but their goal is to silence us. And a lot of people have been silenced in the Philippines. We see it in the numbers on Facebook. Facebook on Alexa ranking went from number one in 2017 to number eight in January 2018, and it's now leveling at around number five. Um, and then the campaign that worked, uh, hashtag inspire courage. And it took the deaths of three teenage boys. So from August 2016 to August 2017, there was a spiral of silence. It worked. Uh, and it was against normal people, against journalists. And I would still say journalists are still, uh, we're still a favorite target. And we struggle every day uh, to, to push back against it. So um, the traditional tools of journalism, you got to tell people. And sometimes people don't want to hear, and we don't even know if they're listening, but you keep doing it. The, the, the other part out to your question, the longer term effects. I was a war zone correspondent, you know, and, and in, those, in, in those, the last decade I was working, I would go from one war zone to another war zone, and conflict reporting is so much easier than what we're dealing with right now. <laughs> Because you know where the gunfire is coming from, and you know how to chart your path to safety, right? And you know how to assess the risks. When does an online threat become physical? Um, when does exponential hate trigger someone you may not even know to actually take action? These are things that we've had to think about as an organization, because I have Young reporters, my palace reporter is 26 years old. She was banned by the president from the palace. And this is, this, that's very real. So what have we done? Um, we sent our entire social media team um, for, cycle, for, for, for counseling. And there's no counseling like this out in our part of the world yet, right? So even that is new ground. But it helped. It's PTSD at a different level. But if you accept that this environment is polluted and that you will steal yourself. Then you move forward and you begin looking for solutions. And where I get excited is we're still a startup, right? We're a startup that scaled. We broke even in year five. And the government attacks have, have bashed us a bit. But now I'm challenged. If we make it through this, I mean, we're made, right? <laughs> so so um, things are changing so fast. The technology and the way people's awareness are moving, the more we move with the technology. And that's why we can't let go. I just last week decided we're collaborating with Facebook uh, as fact checkers in the Philippines. And the two news groups that they chose, the other news group calls President Duterte a liar all the time, right? So the, president, the palace has said they're going to go uh, and, and talk to Facebook to change their fact checkers. Facebook better hold the line, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thanks so much. We're going to give the last question to Barbie. Who better to ask a question about diverse risk and the diffuse risk? Before you ask it, Barbie, I just want to let people know, stay tuned uh, for book sales upstairs over a delicious, healthy, and fatty lunch. It will be all <laughs> over to you, Barbie. Thank you for a terrific presentation. I, I guess I want to get back to the question, um, the status of that. Um, and the status of activism, thinking about how it rolls forward into the other panels of this conference, those being journalism, documentary, and entertainment, each of which has its own ethos, right? And particularly in this country, about how not to abide by perspective and bias and, and, and opinion. So I'm wondering if, briefly, because I know we're over time, can you just um, address what, what you have seen changes, and if it changes, what we need to be doing in the more traditional platforms? Such an easy question. 
Uh, well, I'll go first. There was an article in the, Wall St in the um, Washington Post about a week and a half ago about the number of people showing up to march. One in five Americans have marched since Trump took office, and for many of them, they were not involved. So I think more broadly, as opposed to like, you know, concrete steps people are taking, like the indivisible groups or other actions they're taking, it's heartening to know that this really isn't a traditional Republican Democrat construct, that there are, is a whole swath of our country that has not been politically engaged and don't view what's currently going on as politics. They view it as a fight for our democracy and a fight for our values. And these people are off the sidelines and engaged. So it's an opportunity with those people who are not consuming things in a traditional way and are um, involved in different ways in their communities and their groups or, or whatever, they're gonna show up to vote. Um, and I think the, the media is totally missing that uprising they did in 2017, November. They're going to again in 2018. Um, to harness those energies and, and um, you know, for me, the act of remembering is an act of resistance. So the act of like reading what's going on and the information um, is how we then fight against what's happening to our democracy and our truth. Um, I think there's, we're in a moment that has some positives and some negatives. I think the positive is that there are so many people who are new to activism, want to get engaged, have shown up, whether it's to a march or just angry, want to do something. Um, there's a lot of latent potential right now. And I think the bad news is that that is not a permanent fixture. I think people, especially what, I, what I've seen over the past several years, you know, th this current iteration of the movement, uh, you know, we saw this in Ferguson in 2014 and 2015, we saw a movement emerge. And I think in many cases, what happened was you get burnout because people really want to do something. They try their best and nothing changes. Um, and I worry about what would happen if that happens here because you only get people once. And so if you have everybody engaged now and then everybody gets completely disenchanted and, and apathetic, then you really can't, you don't get a second chance. Um, and, I th and I think the problem is that the infrastructure for engaging people has not yet caught up with the scale of people who need to be engaged. And so what you see are people who want to get engaged. They sign up for every organization's newsletter and every organization. You know, they reach out to people. They want to volunteer. Uh, and most pl places won't get back to them because they're already swamped. The places that get back to them may have something for them to do every two weeks. But all of that potential, people want to get engaged now when they feel angry now. And if you can't harness that when they want to get, get engaged, how they want to get engaged, and immediately connect them to something to do, then we lose that potential. And I haven't seen an effective way of doing that at scale developed yet. I think Twitter is probably the best that we have, where you can immediately get in the conversation, you can learn about what's happening, you can connect with people. Um, but I think there's still something missing there where it should be as easy as, you know, I'm in this zip code, I care about this issue, and, and it's like, here are the three things that you can do right now. And that doesn't wait on, you know, some gatekeeper to have to have the capacity and the time to, to manage you in that process. Um, I think we have to get there in order to, to overcome that, uh, that bottleneck. I think the different panels that are coming up, I, I really look forward to them because uh, in order to have great civic engagement, we need to move people away from this emotion-filled lack of thinking. You know, um, Daniel Kahneman wrote a book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, right? Uh, social networks push us into the thinking fast, unthinking, reality and that is why the engagement keeps spurring right so what are i think i see this in the philippines our younger generation they're pancake people they know a lot of little things about a lot of different things with no depth and so we need to the next panels need to figure out how are we going to reach them? How are we going to reach them? And I'll add two things. When I used to do television, it was always about form and substance, right? Form and substance, because there's the form of whatever that art form is, and then there's the substance of the message that you bring in and how you do it, how sophisticated or how creative makes a difference. I'm going to add a third one, which is form, substance, and distribution. Now, because it's separated, the distribution needs to be worked at as much as the art, the creativity, and the discipline of each of the panels that are coming up next. I'm going to go back to the first point about infrastructure, because I think that's the crucial part that's genuinely badly, badly missing. Like the whole 
big thesis in my book is that the marches don't signal the same kind of power they did. We had giant marches in the Middle East. We have marches in Occupy. We had marches in Indignados. It, it's a boom-bust cycle exactly because we're missing the infrastructure. And to this day, um, movements are still trying to do their decision making on Facebook and Twitter. Okay, so Facebook's the kind of platform, the whole point is to keep you on there, which means it's going to push um, emotional content, right? Outrage, like, or things like that, and it's going to try to keep you there, anger. And like, a lot of us are faculty. When you get in a faculty meeting, what's your first thought? Like, you want it to end, right? <laughs> no, it's fine, you know, my, fa my colleagues are awesome, but you know, we want it to end. For Good reasons, because you want to make decisions. We're making decisions. Social movements around the world are making decisions on Facebook, on Twitter, that are so unsuited to decision making, they could not be less suited to decision making and concluding things. So what we end up having is movements paralyzed by lack of decision making ability at scale. If you're gonna have a movement, you need a decision making ability at scale. In the past, that was solved with organization and leadership you're not going to go back to the past either. There's a participatory sensibility. You're not going to say, where's our next Martin Luther King and we're done, right? I mean, it's not that any movement in the moment lacks people of great courage. It lacks decision-making infrastructure that fits the current participatory movement type. And I don't, and I think that kind of infrastructure could be built. It's partly technical, partly political, but it needs investment. It's the kind of thing a nonprofit or university could do. Um, and if you look at this country, uh, the Koch brothers alone funded um, in 2016 down ballot races to the tune of about $950 million. Uh, indivisibles to the state raised maybe 15, 20 million. So just the right infrastructure was in the billions with a B, whereas the left infrastructure, even after all this brouhaha, is a few millions, basically. On the this side of the political spectrum, on the left side, you do not have the Silicon Valley people don't write the checks. Uh, you don't have the equivalent to the right-wing billionaires who write the checks. And there's very little funding to the state in infrastructure building for movement work. That includes technology, that includes other things. It's the kind of thing academy could do, and I say this in a nonpartisan thing, right? It, it, it's lacking around the world in the sense that movements happen, but they disintegrate partly because they end up bickering on Twitter. Because if you're doing your conversations on Twitter, you've got flame wars, you've got abuse, you will run into the ground. There's a great Mark Lynch article about Arab Spring and Twitter devolutions. Twitter has been great for social movements in the Arab Spring. It has also paralyzed them because it is only suited to bickering or getting attention, which is good. You need this new infrastructure to come from somewhere. I, it's a big question we still face. I hope that we can continue our civilized discourse at a slower <laughs> pace, also over food and those long reads known as books that are upstairs. Thanks for our panelists and thanks to all of you.